Bagan again, Galtan. In a Fanaromo, we don't say welcome. We say congratulations on your peaceful arrival home. Depending on how you say it, that word baga can also stand in for a phrase like, so be it, baga. Or, I know that's right, baga. In the shortest way possible, it means I'm grateful for your audacity, I'm grateful for your being, I'm grateful that you, this happened. So I'll start with not only saying baga nagayan galtan, but also just simply baga. I don't care if you're an architect, well I do care, but I don't care if you're an architect, an artist, an educator, a lumberjack, an editor, or a writer. I'm just grateful that you are. And I'm grateful that despite the rain and the general chaos of today's world, you decided to come home this weekend. One of my favorite moments of this year's conference was when Gabriela apologized that Portuguese was her colonial language, especially because it was right when she was talking about our relationship to the ground in a way that I immediately understood. There is so much meaning that our colonial languages simply cannot and will not hold. So much is lost in translation and we need to name that. For example, I could tell you my name is Malika Hawa Amrilla Abajabo, but I would rather tell you my name means Queen Eve, daughter of the will of God, granddaughter of the father of the mountain. In Oromo culture, names are not simply for being called. They're for holding your personhood, which cannot be separated from your family, your home. So when Jermaine said each of our bodies is also a home, I felt that. And I would even add that in each of our names is an address a location or a destination, and a dream only realized when we show up fully and completely as ourselves. No one can separate me from my home because it's in my name, it's mine, and therefore no one can distract me from my work and my mission, which is the preservation of my home. So we've had asked several questions this weekend. On Friday, we began by asking, how do we celebrate the black home? Yesterday, we asked how do we make and remake the black home. Today, we ask how do we preserve the black home. When we came to this year's theme, we considered many texts and interpretations of what black home even means. One of those foundational texts was Home Place by Bell Hooks. She said that the construction of a home place, however fragile and tenuous, the slave hut, the wooden shack, had a radical dimension one's home place was the site where one could freely construct the issue of humanization, where one could resist. Black women resisted by making homes where all black people could strive to be subjects, not objects, where we could be affirmed in our minds and hearts despite poverty, hardship, and deprivation, where we could restore ourselves the dignity denied us on the outside and in the public world. It is a privilege to live life unedited, a privilege which is not afforded to many black and queer people. Ja Amazi, Andrea Yarbrough, Annika hanstein Azora, and Dr. Nick Adler build home places where we can all live unedited in our first drafts. It is my privilege and honor to introduce our first moderator of the day, Ja Amazi. Ah, good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. And also, good morning to all of you. Good morning. Good morning. I know yesterday we started, and one of the panelists said good morning, and when y'all said good morning back, he's like, oh, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. And I was like, I was. Because <laughs> we a call and response community last I checked, so we're going to try that one more time. I know it's early on a Sunday. I know it's raining, but you're still here, so good morning. Good morning. Okay, that's a little bit better. I'm gonna check on you later in the day. I am absolutely grateful to be here, uh, both at this conference, being welcomed home, able to moderate this panel, and in conversation and company with y'all. I'm very excited for what we are going to attempt to do in what feels like a very short amount of time. Uh, but we are gonna get into it. I will encourage folks, if you have urgent questions, as we're talking, raise your hand. We want to be in conversation as much as possible. We think that's important. I don't know if our volunteers are prepared for that. It's okay, Bubba's. 
Everybody, this is Ezra. Ezra Mazi has joined us. This is our 16-month-old son, who every time I get on a microphone has different feelings about it. <laughs> and that is one of them today. So yes, please do feel encouraged to be in conversation and in dialogue with us. Uh, we have no intent on you know just kind of talking amongst ourselves and then waiting. That's not how we want to do this. So really quickly, I want to orient us all to the purpose of our panel today, which is to explore how we as black queer people are consistently creating both tangible and spiritual, permanent and ephemeral spaces of joy, resistance, liberation, and pleasure for black people. That's how we're going to center our conversation today, and I want to remind us of that. If you noticed, we decided to not read bios for me, and we're not going to do that for our panelists as well. I would encourage you all to read the bios. That's why we print them. That's why they're available to you. But I want us to start somewhere else, uh, somewhere where our bios might not lead us. I think that's a more important way to start a conversation. So I'm going to ask each of you to tell us about your name, which I'm very excited about, given the way that we just kicked off this morning. I don't know if you know me. I don't know if you was in my notes. I don't know how we did that, but that was absolutely beautiful and such a serendipitous transition into how I was planning for us to start our panel today, asking folks to talk a little bit about, again, your name, what it means to you, why it is your name, and so forth. So who would like to go first? Well, I'll jump in. Um, my name is Annika Lakiba Hanstein Azora. My mother is Swedish. My father is black. And so they combine their last names with the Hanstein Azora. Lakiba is my grandmother's name. And my first name, Annika, means grace. So I try and live within that for myself and for others. Beautiful. Thank you. I can jump in. So my name is Andrea Yarbrough. Um, so my mother is one of 11. Uh, I think she's somewhere between seven and nine. Um, and she tells the story that my name was actually supposed to be Ashley, but my uncle um, had his daughter three days before I was born. And so he named her Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> and so I became Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, why, why Ashley? Why are you still your mama's name? I have no idea. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And how you feel about your cousin Ashley? I love Ashley. Okay, that's good. <laughs> I know you're saying that because we recorded. That's fine. We're going to talk about Ashley later. That's cool. Hello, everybody. Um, so my name is Nick. Um, or actually, the given name, my, my given name is actually Nikisha. Um, or as my Guyanese grandmother would call me, Nikisha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, I understand the name to mean pioneering or innovative spirit. And I think that that feels very connected to who I am as a person. Um, my chosen name is Nick, or Dr. Nick if you're nasty. Yeah. And, <laughs> oh, I know and, he was doing that this morning. That's why they started us late. That's why they knew. <laughs> And um, I think uh, Nick to me feels like my chosen name. It brings me more closer to um, a non-binary understanding of myself, but I still feel connected to um, the foundation and the name that was given to me. So Nick, Dr. Nick or Nikisha as my girlfriend would call me. I love it. I love it. Uh, I will participate in this question and perhaps some others as we go, but uh, my full name is Janea Dianya, but I prefer to go by Ja or Jadi. But what I want to tell you about is my last name, actually, which is Amazi. And um, it's important to me because my wife and I actually chose our last name when we got married two years ago. Uh, my maiden name is Williams. Her maiden name is Tiller. We were tired of being at the end of the alphabet. No, that, I mean, that is part of it. I'm not even going to lie to y'all. We got graduations to plan for, OK? Uh, but <laughs> Right, right, we're moving up, uh, but no. So we, uh, our friends, before they knew we were dating, they would often say that we move like water. They just said that, you know, you two just got a certain flow about you. It's really majestic, it's really beautiful. And so when we came out as dating uh, each other, they were like, oh, your hashtag is like water. That's how we're gonna refer to y'all. So when we decided that we wanted to change our name, we started looking up water in different languages. Kelly, I can take him if that's easier. We, we here, we at home. We can do whatever we need to do, boo. They gonna figure it out, we gonna put it on the camera, we got the boobs, however this needs to go. 
Um, and so when we decided that, yeah, we were going to change our names, we started looking up water in different languages. And uh, for those of you that are familiar with Mass Design Group, which is where I work, we have a Kigali office. And uh, Kelly actually came across Amazi, which means water in Kinarawanda. And so I called up one of my colleagues. I was like, this true? This real? Does this make sense? Don't have me out here looking crazy. This is about to be my name. Uh, and he's like, no, you're good. This, you're right. And so we became the Amazis. And it just gives me so much joy that we were able to start our family by starting our naming. I thought that was just really, really uh, a beautiful opportunity for us. So. Thank you all for indulging me in that. Again, y'all's homework is to actually read through these bios because they are stacked, they are stellar, they are tremendous folks that we are, we are sitting here in conversation with. But all of us decided in our prep call that the reading of the bio won't it. That's just, yeah, no, we was like, mm, no, like, you know, everything just clenches, like your teeth clench, your fists clench, your butt clench. While they're reading your bio, you just yes. be sitting there mad uncomfortable. We, we wasn't gonna do that. Uh, so read the bios, y'all. Thank you for the name information. So our p panel today is titled Black Home and Queerness. And it was important for us before we really got into the questions and into the conversation that we take the time that is necessary to actually define what blackness is, what queerness is, what home is for each of us as a way to begin explaining some of the other things that we want to talk about to y'all. So I'm going to ask you all to go through your experiences and talk about what blackness, what queerness and or home means to you. You can touch all three, you can touch one. And if in doing so, you can also talk a little bit about where those definitions come from, who those definitions come from, I think that would be helpful for the folks in the room. Now, this is the one question that I'm definitely going to ask everybody to answer, if you still feel comfortable. And if not, just be like, nah, ja, I got you later. Uh, but I think it's important that everybody understand where y'all are coming from in this dialogue. Mm. So anybody can go first. We can go in reverse or order, you know, however we want to do it. <laughs> I love how you just got tagged. <laughs> and go. Yikes. <laughs> Okay, um, so I think that as I'm thinking about blackness, um, it to me is the technology that makes it so that we find um, cook up rice in Guyana, jollof rice in Ghana, and um, rice and peas in Jamaica, or peas and rice, depending on which of the places in the diaspora you are from. <laughs> Um, and I think it's also uh, related to um, or an understanding of this diasporic experience through that technology that makes it so that we are persisting through wherever we are, wherever we've landed, wherever we've been moved toward, wherever we've migrated, we are persisting. Um, and so I think that's my understanding of blackness. Who? Other, <laughs> other parts of the question? Queerness. Queerness. Um, if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, maybe I'll dive into home. Home for me is sort of, um, as a diaspora, a kid of the diaspora, um, home right now is based in Chicago and is grounded. <laughs> We're not doing that today. It's grounded. <laughs> that was yesterday. We back. <laughs> we back. We back. We back. It's based in Chicago. Um, and it's sort of grounded in sort of, um, I think my summer of house music is what I'm thinking about as I'm thinking about home right now, um, which has sort of created the foundation that's wrapped me in its arms and kept me um, because I, I'm not from Chicago. So I know I'm repping Chicago, but I'm not actually from there. Um, so that's like one point in terms of like my home or my migration story. And then um, if I move backward, I'm coming from New York. Um, I'm actually born in Brooklyn, but raised in Queens. And um, home is Flatbush Avenue or Nostrand Avenue and hearing um, reggae, soca. The sounds to me that sound very much like house and home um, and that technology that makes it so that black sounds, it's, we are everywhere. And um, that, that to me is what feels like home. Mm. Yeah, I'm gonna pause there. Mm -hmm. um, so home for me is also Chicago. <laughs> um, and you did it to yourselves. <laughs> 
you know, I, I, I guess, you know, one of the things that I really love about Chicago, and I, I lived away for almost 10 years, um, and when I came back, I realized how much I miss sitting on porches. Mm. Um, and so porch culture is home for me. Um, stepping is home for me. Yes. Um, I come from a family of steppers. Uh, my goal for myself for my 30th birthday was to learn how to properly step, um, <laughs> not bop. And so I um, spent a lot of time at the Grand Ballroom, which is home for me. Um, and just being around black folks, like that's, that's home for me. And I feel like that is, is blackness for me in many ways. Um, queerness um, is really interesting. I, I had a conversation with my youngest aunt um, in which I told her, you know, I, I identify as queer. And she was like, you know, she whispered to me and said, don't tell anybody that, don't say that out loud. Um, because her understanding was this, this very derogatory term. And we had this conversation about the ways in which language has changed, um, but also like what queerness means for me, which is more of a political ideology, um, and about how I move through the world. And so really thinking about um, alternatives to spaces um, and alternatives to ideas that we have, that's, that's where queerness sits for me. Mm. Something when, that I think about with all three of these terms is that they aren't meant to have one definitive answer. Like people dedicate their entire lives and scholarship just to parsing out like each of these terms. But Ja, I wanna thank you for bringing up water and like the meaning of water because when I'm thinking of each of these terms, I think about poet Dion Brand and she has a line where she says, I do not believe in time. I do believe in water, and I feel like with each of these terms, there is a fluidity and an ephemeral nature within each of them. When I think about queerness, I'm thinking of insistence of something beyond the here and now. There's like a potentiality that I'm reaching for, something that moves me to move beyond normality or the way that things have always been. And that same insistence of potentiality is also what I see in blackness, in living blackness, in remaking and reimagining and remixing. And when I think about home within a queer context, I think about how for many queer people, home when rooted in blood, when rooted in our blood family is oftentimes not a space of safety, mm -hmm. how that home is not rooted in who we may see as blood family, but home for me can be ephemeral, it can be temporary, it can be a dance floor, it is the home that I build with kin, it is my homie's couch on a Friday night. It's approaching October and we're coming into like the holiday season and I'm thinking about how the holidays can be a point of tension for queer people because people will ask, well, are you going home for the holidays? Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is not, not where you are arriving because that's not your point of safety. So when I'm thinking of home from a queer perspective, I'm also thinking of like literally Vogue and drag houses. <laughs> like I am thinking of the spaces that black queer people have made home even within the temporary, you know? Um, so it's, all three of these are a project of remixing and living and reimagining. I don't know if I'm gonna get my microphone back, so I'm gonna hold it here, <laughs> and hopefully y'all in the back can still hear me, but I appreciate all of you taking the time to talk through that, and I certainly expect that as we continue to answer some of these questions, other definitions and other layers will, co will come up for you. But something that I definitely heard, okay, I wasn't loud enough to just, you don't think they could hear me? Thank you, sir, appreciate you. Uh, but something that I'm definitely hearing in each of your responses is this ephemeral nature that you point to, is kind of this uh, intangible aspect of us being able to create these places of home or these identities of queerness um, and also understanding that is something that is, is, is cultural, it sounds like to me, in terms of the music and the food and the dancing and porch culture, as you put it. And so I think that's helpful for all of us to understand as we go into this conversation. So Dr. Nick, I wanna go back to you uh, for a moment because in your bio, it tells us that you're on an ancestral assignment to foster Diaspora, diasporic belonging. 
And when we spoke last week, you mentioned the importance of language, right? You were talking a little bit about how how one references home and what home might mean to them and how that is different depending on where you are from and where you are going is critical. And so can you share more on what this diaphoric belonging means to you and how language can be at the center of that? Um, so I think um, as I'm processing the question and sitting with um, this nature of like diasporic belonging, um, for me, I think being based, or sort of like being born in New York to parents who are from Guyana, um, this sense of home was also, as we're speaking about ephemeral, it was like mythological in some nature. It was like something that was sort of like talked about as like this nostalgic place, this place that I know that I have a home that I haven't yet been to. Um, and in terms of this piece about belonging, um, to me it's, it's finding this sense of connection, um, the sense of community throughout the diaspora. So wherever black people are, I often would say when folks ask me like, where do I want to take Party Noir or sort of the practice that I'm sort of creating space for queer folks, I would say wherever there are black people, that's where I want to take Party Noir. That's where I want to sort of create these spaces. Um, and for me, it's sort of, yes, the connection, drawing lines of connection, though we've been sort of like moved and migrated and um, spread throughout uh, the diaspora, I want to create these, these points of connection. Um, did I answer the full question? I, I, I think you did. Did, did, did y'all get a full answer? Anybody need a clarifying question? <laughs> clarifying point? Sound good to me. I'm, I'm good with it. Did y'all have any follow-up questions to those thoughts? Okay. All right. Well, then, Anika, I'm going to go to you. And uh, so we know that care is oftentimes a feminized. What do you need, my love? You don't even know. Do you want to run the panel? You mad because you don't got your name tag on? Tell me. <laughs> can, can I get through the question? I did comb out my hair this morning. Thank you. I don't need, I don't need no help. I'm going to finish the question, OK? Anyways, uh, we know that care is oftentimes a feminized practice. So what thoughts do you have on how we can avoid perpetuating patriarchy as we uplift care in our homes? Mm. When I think about that question, I think about two locations within myself. The first is that I'm a black genderqueer person and I'm also the eldest daughter. And there are, as, there are infinite expressions of blackness and there are infinite expressions of gender. And so what I'm naming is for myself. It is not the experience of every other black trans or non-binary person. But for myself, my black girlhood and black womanhood are inseparable from my genderqueer experience. They weave into each other. They inform one another. And I named that location of the eldest daughter because as much pride and as much joy and as much center as that is in my life, it also is a point of reflection on the ways that one can non-consensually be made a caretaker for others and the complications of care and the history within it. And I think that care can oftentimes be romanticized. We are living in a self-care era, you know, where marketers have understood that that language mm -hmm. is something that they can tap into. But care has a very complex history, especially for black people, particularly for gender marginalized people, particularly for black women and femmes. We can look at the history of it across time, whether we're thinking of the black mammy, whether we're thinking of the magical Negro, there is this non-consensual framework of having to be made caretaker. And the second location that I want to name is my work with Black Feast. So Black Feast is a 
event that I run with my creative partner, Salamatu Amabebe, who is the founder of Black Feast. And we create culinary interpretations of black artists' work. And so the table and the dinner table is made an ephemeral home for the people that sit there. And we do this work because we believe that care is what pulls the futures that we dream of into the present, while also understanding while also understanding that there's also a complex history to black caretaking and black kitchens and black food work and the history and traumas that that can contain. So when I'm thinking of my relationship with care, I'm thinking about how can I approach care from a way that is not employing, as Audre Lorde would say, the master's tools in building it, in sharing it. And to me, that ultimately means queering care. When I named in my definition of what care, or what queerness means to me, which to me means potentiality, it is, in, it is insistence. Um, you named this morning audacity. It is the audacity to dream of something different. So when I'm thinking about how we can practice care in a way that is moving against patriarchy, it means practicing care in a way that is not employing the master's tools. It means reimagining it and remixing it. And that's a, you know, heady, perhaps, way to think about it. But there are practical ways that we can live that question as well, of how do I approach care without recreating domination. A practical way is if each of us took a moment to meditate on what does care mean in my life? Who were the first caretakers in my life? What did they teach me about what care is and what care isn't? And I also want to make clear that when I'm talking about the feminized history of care, that isn't to say that black women or femme people or feminine people are the only ones that do and can do care labor. Like the, the gendered politics of care fucks shit up for everybody. Like it causes like negative implications for masculine people, for men as well from like the narrative of I have to be a rock to like the idea that needing care is a weakness. But the other like implications, the other ways that we can question like that care is, you know, again, questioning our narratives of what we've been taught about it. It can mean creating strategies to make sure that like tired black women and tired black femmes aren't the only one doing care labor in your organization or in your space. Mm -hmm. It can mean questioning the ways that desirability leaks into the ways we see who is and who is not deserving of care. It means really, pushing everything we imagine about it. So I think the everyday pushing, the everyday remixing is where I land with how we can do that. And I'm gonna jump in really quick. Um, I think mostly because I steward a space called In Care of Black Women. Yes. Um, and I, I, I entered the, the project really thinking about you know, how can I invite other people to think about their relationship to black women in care? Mm. And that you don't have to be a black woman to think about care for black women. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of that work was doing what we call care histories, um, where we were interviewing black women about their first experiences of care, their relationships to care, how they wanted to be cared for, and creating an archive so that people can go and look to. And they could never say, well, we didn't know how to care for black women, um, because there's a space in which you can go and you can listen. Um, and you can see images of sites in which they, they consider sites of care. Um, and just thinking about you know, the, the challenges that black women face. And so when I was doing this work, it was from a, a curatorial lens that, you know, I wanted to create a show in vacant lots that um, really kind of exhumed the invisibility of black women working in, in public art, in public space, um, working in wood, working in metal. And I was constantly told there were no black women in Chicago doing that. And I was like, all right, if, if y'all say that, then we're just gonna build an archive. Like we're gonna do it ourselves. Um, and so I started to build tables 
and I invited black women to build seats to bring to those tables. Mm -hmm. And nobody knew how to build. And so that was our, our biggest challenge. And so it became this space where we could, we could create a space centered around making that was not male dominated. Um, and if you've been in any of the trade spaces, like they can be terrible for, for women, for non-binary folks, for queer folks. And so creating a space specific for, specifically for black women to come together to learn how to make, to learn how to build, um, to be able to put objects out into public space and to gather and again, to think about their relationships to care and invite other folks into those conversations as well um, felt incredibly important. Mm. I, I really appreciate all of what you all are bringing up. And I think something that is resonating for me in both of your responses is this kind of this understanding that we as black folks and as queer folks especially at this intersection of black queerness, mm -hmm. are constantly creating our own spaces. We, we are carving out, erecting, immersing in, defining, redefining, taking the scraps of, taking the bottom of, taking the top of, to say, OK, this is if I have to be at the margins, this is, this is how I'm going to be at the margins, and this is how I'm going to invite others to push on those margins and get us to a place to where you will see us, you will hear us. And so there's this kind of um, agency that I'm, I'm hearing come up in a lot of what y'all are sharing, and, and I am grateful for that. I appreciate that. I'm going to pause uh, just for a moment and acknowledge that Ezra was not having it. I think the lights were a little too much for him. He could see all y'all just staring at him. <laughs> He ain't want to have his late breakfast. He ain't want to do the moderating. Uh, so he and Kelly are in the hallway. But I know a number of y'all yesterday was like, where's Ezra and Kelly? Well, they're here now. You're welcome. <laughs> That's what you get when you ask for a 16-month-old to show up at a conference. Uh, and I am not offering any of that as an apology, because y'all said welcome home. And home is where those two are for uh -huh. me. So yes, sir. Uh, he will be back. <laughs> And he will probably disrupt your panels. So <laughs> you're welcome. There we are. Uh, so Andrea, can you talk to us a little bit? And I think some of what you were just sharing in terms of the, the project that you just referenced might also relate to this. But um, if you could talk to us a little bit about the potential of solidarity economics and how that adds to the formation and resilience of the black queer home, I think all of us would appreciate that. Yeah, definitely. Um, so you know, I've been doing in care of for four years now, and um, so one of the things that happened was early on, I, I realized you know this this kind of it started pre-pandemic, and then the pandemic hit, and everybody you know went online and in homes, and we didn't have access to each other and spaces to really create together. Um, but I had this idea, you know, pre-pandemic that I wanted to just like set up a wood shop and a shipping container and take it around to all these vacant lots and build all these objects in these spaces. Um, and then it dawned on me, there's no electricity, so you, you can't do that in the vacant lot. Um, but I was able to seek out some funding and build a wood shop. And so I, I had bought a building right before the pandemic, and I built the wood shop in the basement of the building. Um, and that kind of became this experimental space to just make. Um, and when I was inviting these black women to build chairs, other folks kept reaching out like, hey, I want to learn how to build a chair too. Um, and, and my building skills at that time were incredibly limited. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was watching a lot of YouTube videos. Um, <laughs> working one-on-one -on -one, uh, with, with an artist in Chicago. Um, and we would just mask up and go into his studio, and he would teach me how to make things. And I realized the importance of space. Um, and so you know, as we continue to kind of make you know, individually, some folks reached out and said, hey, like, could we do a workshop? And so it started turning into workshop spaces where we could gather you know, 10 people or so, and we could do some building in the basement and then pop out into the backyard and do some building there. Um, and then folks started asking me, can I rent the space? And because the space is in my home, um, I felt a little uncomfortable renting space to folks in my home. Um, but what I did, I, I sought some funding and I offered a residency. And so it became a, a woodshop residency where, again, black women, femmes, non-binary folks could come 
And it was a space to just play, explore, make. You didn't have to have any experience. You didn't have to be making for a show or an exhibition. Um, it was really just, you know, to, to play. Um, and then, you know, there was a challenge in which, you know, artists work at different times of the day. Some folks, 3 a.m. Um, so you turn it on table saws at 3 a.m. and I'm upstairs sleeping. Um, and so it, it became a challenge. You know, I, I outgrew the space very quickly. And so it made me realize that I needed something else. And so I went and bought another building um, and, you know, realized like in, in my journey with my own building and, and having, you know, tenants, like I'm, I'm not interested in being a landlord. Um, it just doesn't, I'm, I'm not really cut out for it. But what I am interested in is co-ownership and owning things with other folks. And so when I was in graduate school, I took some planning classes, and one of them was Solidarity Economy. Um, and I learned a lot about community land trust, about worker, worker cooperatives, um, and I was the only non-planning student in these courses. Um, I, was, I was an art student. And so the professor kept asking me, like, why are you here? Like, you know, what, what are you trying to do? I was like, I think I, you know, I have this idea about starting an artist co-op here in Chicago. Um, and I bought this building. I don't quite know what I'm going to do with it, but it's a mixed use. It's huge. It needs a lot of work. Um, and so I'm thinking about it as this cooperative venture. And so through In Care Of, we've been incubating a co-op um, as an artist space. And so it's a mixed use space in which folks have spaces to live and work. Um, my wood shop will move there. We'll have a dark room. Um, and we'll have a lot of kind of open gallery spaces, retail spaces for folks to be able to come together cooperatively. Um, it'll be owned cooperatively, but we operate it cooperatively. And really just thinking about alternatives to capitalism. Um, I think that like I've I've been in a lot of spaces where I've been able to do like a lot of really incredible things. But what I've learned is that I, I never really do them on my own. They're always collaborations in some way. Um, and you know, there's these hierarchies and these dynamics that I think that we're taught to kind of to play into. And I think, you know, in, in terms of how I, I queer spaces and I queer my work, that's what I wanted to bring to it. I wanted to think about wealth building for other artists. Um, and, I, and, and at its core, like I was thinking about my friends, you know, folks kept asking me, like, how did you buy this place? And I was like, well, I bought it when I had a nine to five. Um, and most artists are not going to go get a nine to five job and they can't get a mortgage. And so how do you access, you know, space in a different way? So I became really interested in thinking about how do we get access to space in a different way and what does it mean for us to come together in this cooperative way to pool our resources and to be able to do this work. Um, and so a lot of the work is study. Um, if you look at the history of cooperatives, most cooperatives, you know, quote unquote, fail because they, they lose their study element. Um, they stop studying together. Mm -hmm. And so at the core of our work is we, we study. Um, we, we've done 12 weeks of like actual core education together with the outside facilitator. Um, and now we have like an ongoing study group where we read a text together um, and we meet weekly um, on top of like moving our business goals forward. But a lot of it is about understanding like how cooperatives function, what the values are, what's at the core of that work so that we don't lose sight of it and fall into the individualism that, you know, is, is around us. All right, I might come to Chicago. <laughs> I might could. By the way, anybody from Boston? Anybody? Okay, I got. <laughs> I, got I got two. How many was it? Any, anybody from New England? <laughs> Damn, y'all, come on! I'm born and raised in Boston, and so okay, California. What does that have to do with Massachusetts? <laughs> what are you doing? You didn't got on a whole plane. What are we? Lord, all right, next time, I'm going to get me a Massachusetts contingency <laughs> at the conference that's held in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Anyways, I do uh, feel as though each of you have probably given us enough about your practice and about why it is that you're doing the work that you do that we could uh, turn it to the audience here and see if any folks have any questions, either about what has already been said or other things that you might have been thinking about coming into this panel having read their bios. So I see a question here. Come on, Boston. I know you're not from, I know, I know, but I appreciate, I know, I can see it in your face. She was like, mm -mm. No, no. you ain't raise your hand when I asked. I know. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, so, Andrea, you had mentioned this, you know, practice of play. And I think oftentimes in our adulthood, we get so caught up in producing labor and doing things on or for others' behalf or even for our own for business reasons. So I wanted to ask how important play is for you all and what does play look like for you? Mm. 
Well, I think for me, play is um, currently this reorientation to my relationship to work where I don't dream of labor. I don't, I don't, I don't want to work. Um, I want to sort of create space for myself um, to play, space that is collectively stewarded. Um, so one of the images that you see, um, it's not showing right now, but that was circling as um, the slideshow was going, is um, a, a program that a Collective and I are running in Chicago called a Co-Work and Playscape. And it is essentially an invitation for queer folks who are artists, creatives, um, entrepreneurs to just come and play. And it could look like us popping up and a person is sort of like doing embroidery. Um, we're doing Legos together. We are literally finding place outside to just put our feet in the grass and maybe journal together. Um, and I think it's sort of like a reclaiming of my time, <laughs> um, a reclaiming of my resource and energy, and I'm doing it in a way that is, um, again, sort of like stewarding a collective reorientation to play, because I think that, as you said, our time is being stolen, our resources are being stolen. Um, and so, yeah, play is, is foundational, I think, right now. Yeah, I feel similarly in that it is foundational in the work that I do. Like, I feel like I approach play from a perspective of allowing myself to express and reimagine without any hand on the output, without any expectation on what that output is going to be. So just giving myself a moment outside of time, like we've thought, we've talked a bit about time, but giving myself a moment that exists outside of time when I'm just in flow. I play with my gender, I play with my writing, I play as like a practice that just brings me nourishment, you yes. know, because I need, we need nourishment, we need sustenance to sustain this work and so play becomes one of those grounding, nourishing spaces. Yeah. So yeah, it's the food, like it's the necessary food. I'm gonna toss it real, real quick, because last night we were talking about a play practice, um, and everyone assumes that because I'm curating space and making homes on the dance floor that I can DJ. I cannot. <laughs> but I am in this current moment learning to DJ, and it's just a practice of play. I have no plans on being booked to DJ yes. anywhere except my bedroom. Yes. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Okay. And it's the nourishing. Right. It's the work. It's it's what's actually sustaining me to just explore, be, being a beginner again, learning a new thing. Um, yes. Yeah, the kindergarten approach. <laughs> like, I'm just here, vibing, <laughs> like, Love having it. my time. I yeah, I... Um, I didn't used to play a lot. Uh, my, my friends considered me to be very serious, um, and I'm a double Capricorn, if that means anything to you. So, <laughs> it's rough. Um, <laughs> but I, like, my, my play practices really be, like, came about in making. Um, you know, like every quarter I take a different woodworking wood class. Um, I've been learning to scroll saw this year. I've been doing a lot of scroll sawing. Um, and it's just like, things that I make for myself. It's not things that I'm like showing in public spaces or making for other people at this point. Um, but I find a lot of joy in it. The reason that I did the woodshop, you know, residency space to allow folks to play is because, um, you know, when people were taking workshops with me, I, I take it very serious because I'm like, it's dangerous. Y'all are like with saws and whatnot. Um, and it felt a little intense, I think, for some people. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, like, you're so serious. Like, let's bring it down. And so mm -hmm. it's just a space to play. Like, we're, we're not making a specific thing, but you're learning how to use tools and so forth. And I can be a lot more relaxed. Yes. California. West side? Um. <laughs> I'm from California too. All so, right, let's yes. do it then. <laughs> and so, um, I guess my question is that you know I live in San Francisco right now, and I lived in D.C. You know, there's a mainstream definition of queerness, which is sort of white. Mm, sort but, of. Uh, yeah, sort of. Very. But when I go to black queer spaces, it is black as all hell. I mean, like it is the blackest experience. It's very weird. Like, do you feel like? black queer spaces are blacker, and it's a very, it's a hard spectrum to do it, but you know, like, if I'm in Chelsea out, and then I go to the Bronx, I'm like, shit, this is black. You know, if I'm 
Oh, I said shit. I'm sorry, y'all. You know, but I mean, but we, like, we ain't here. you know, if I'm somewhere in D.C. and then I go to Bachelor's Mill or go somewhere, you know, Black Pride, it just feels really, really black, you know, in a way that like even in more black straight spaces doesn't feel black. And so at that intersection, does it amplify the blackness or give us an opportunity to amplify it or do something different that adds to the black? It's black on black in some instances. <laughs> just trying to get your perspectives. I answer it first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to answer because I want to make space. I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> Hell yes. I think like I, you noted audacity. I noted audacity. Like there is something about how there is a wider margin of freedom to express audacity in yeah, yeah, yeah. queer space, you know, like, and I think what is being tapped into is like the expression like the that widening of margin like to like really show the full radius of oneself i think is something that you're speaking to and i don't i don't remember what writer scholar intelligent person said this but there is an essay that's named my gender is black and i think about that like when I am in queer space and I am feeling that heaviness leave my shoulder that I don't feel in white queer spaces. So I don't know, that blackness squared, like to me it's made possible like through just like the widening of freedom in some kind of way of I, self and other, yeah. I just, I have to expand on my yes just a little bit because I remember <laughs> when I first came out one thing my mother said to me, and y'all, my mother's my best friend, most avid supporter. She got all the pronouns down, all the babies' names, as she put it. You know, she's amazing. But when I first came out, she was not. Uh, we had about a year and a half of some difficult moments. And one of the first things she said to me is she was like, that's not no black people shit. That meaning my, my identity, my sexuality. And so what I've noticed in a lot of black communities is we are doubling down on our cultural identity, on our family traditions, on the thing that makes us who we are because we are reclaiming it to say our queerness is also part of our family history, our family traditions. And so for me, like, I was like, oh, you gonna tell a little light skin thing that she not black enough because she queer, ma, let's get it. You know, and so I, I, just, I just really went into it and I feel like that might be an experience of other folks as well. Mm. Anybody else? I'll just throw a little spice. Um, I think that there is, um, you know, when you're home, you are able to unmask in ways that you can't be elsewhere. And so I think to the potentiation, to the, 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 the taking off of what you might have to move through the world in, you're gonna get as black as it gets. <laughs> <laughs> That's real. I have no idea how we're doing on time. I lost my time friend yeah. here. Do I have time for another question? I, I got five. That, that was the five. Hello. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, there's a question in the back, and then I think we're going to come to you. Oh, I see. Okay, we're going to get it, y'all. There's three awesome. more questions, starting with you. Yeah, I just want to say, I thought it was really beautiful that you brought your child on stage. Oh, thank you. And I think the question I have is really around sort of like queerness and multi-generational family, and even sort of we're talking about the expansiveness and like the audacity to like reimagine even what a relationship with a child in space and in family is. And I'm curious how in each of your practices you're exploring like new ways to think of like the queer home as a multi-generational home. Mm -hmm. How are you engaging with elders, engaging with youth? I think also in this moment where one like Black children in particular are consistently under threat. Black children within their family are under threat. And then children in relationship to queer people are under threat. And so how are you sort of in these spaces creating, yeah, like cultivating a new possibility for black multi-generational queer homes? Okay, really quickly. I know you said each of you, but I'm gonna ask one of you to answer that question and then another to answer the second question and then a third to answer the third question because we gonna play with these five minutes as best we can. <laughs> Somebody. I think you should answer. Damn it, okay. Yeah. Uh, so the way in which I'm doing it, honestly, is 
this is not going to sound very profound, but I'm just doing it. So my mother, born and raised in Boston, as am I, she moved to North Carolina while I was an undergrad. As soon as I told her I was pregnant, it was, I'm pregnant, and I need you to come home. Not because I ain't got it, not because we couldn't find childcare, but because that's not what I wanted. I wanted intergenerational loving to, to, to be present for my son, especially because my wife and I are like the only queer people in both our families. And so really giving him an opportunity to see more than just us and all our queer ass friends, I thought it was important for him to have access to his grandmother, but also I was not raised with any grandparents. My All my grandparents passed when my parents were very young. And so the oldest person I've ever been intimately engaged with in conversation is about 60. 61, 62, whereas my wife Kelly, her mother, her grandmother's 92. And she knows what that means. She knows what it means to have somebody of that age in her life. And so I think just finding ways to do it, whether it's with your birth people or with other elders that you love, know, and respect, and introducing them into those intergenerational conversations is 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 really the best way around it. Um, okay, so you, my friend in the back, you said there was a question here. Okay, so we're gonna go way back, and then I'm coming to you, and you're gonna close us out. I see you, I see you. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for the panel. It's been really insightful. I think my question lies in, you, all of you speak about care, and then like there's the idea of like care in relationship to rest. And um, Anika, you mentioned like being the eldest daughter and like how those two identities are like very much intertwined, but like how do you speak about rest? Like how do you, examine that space in space we care mm. well since you're directing to me then i'll <laughs> take i'll take that question i am still learning how to rest <laughs> it was not raised as default within myself and i think you know the the location of the eldest daughter also means that I have a lot to unlearn in terms of I do not need to perform in order to be valued. I don't have to take care of other people. I don't have to overperform. I can just arrive and still within that I'm worthy of care. I'm worthy of rest. I think a rest narrative that has been difficult for me to learn is that I don't have to earn rest. Usually, I push myself to the point that's after where rest was long ago needed. And it's only until I've worked really hard, I've done a project, I've done an event series, I've done something to earn it, then I can access it. And that is something that's really an intergenerational curse. It's a familial curse that I'm working to break, that my siblings are working to break. So I think what that practically looks like is allowing myself to lean into rest in the ways I can, even giving myself 30 seconds before this panel to close my eyes and breathe. Like it begins in the 30 second interludes that we can give ourselves to be like, no, nope, in this exact moment, that's when I'm going to rest. And I think also seeing rest as a rigorous practice mm -hmm. and not rigorous in tiring myself out, but as something that I show up for, that I see as essential to the creative ecosystem of my personhood. Like it is the essential element. So showing up for that in small ways, in small refusals of mm -hmm. overperformance is how. I'm relating to that. Okay, one more question before they kick us out. Go they ahead. get kicked out. I, I think most, I think the last two comments actually got at what I was gonna say. <laughs> it was really just to share some appreciation and maybe throw a little paprika on his words in terms of um, thinking about, you know, how uh, queer folks and queer spaces as being sort of like doubly black that we're often sort of focal point of our homes, like an unseen sort of focal point. So the question was gonna be more so about rest for all that labor, but okay. I'm now kind of interested more so in like the idea of visibility within one's sort of family, um, like the visibility of your queerness and, and how that um, relates to the, to the folks in your family. Andrea or Dr. Nick, one person. Um, yeah, I can share. Um, 
so I like I said, I lived away from home for like 10 years. Um, so I feel like I was like queer on my own. Like I nobody knew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and then I came back home with a partner and it was just like, hey, this is my partner. Um, and everybody's like, oh, OK. <laughs> um, but I, I think that, you know, I, I didn't grow up with anyone in my family who was visibly queer. There are queer folks in my family. They just don't talk about it. Um, and that's what I've learned about, like, an older generation. Um, but I, I had this moment. Um, I was, like, home for maybe Thanksgiving at my aunt's house. And I had some younger cousins there who I didn't really, they, they don't know me well. And they always say, like, where were you? You were never around. And I'm like, oh, I just lived away. Um, and one of them came to me. There are two of them. They're very obviously, you know, to me, visibly queer. Um, and they came to me and they whispered, is that your girlfriend? And I was like, yeah. And then they like ran off laughing about it. Um, and it was a moment for me in which I realized like they saw what they could have, you know? Um, and that it, it was, you know, it was important to like bring my partner to my family's home. Um, even if I was like a little kind of squirmish about it myself and being like, yeah, we're just gonna show up and like see what it is. Um, but yeah, I think it was like really important for them to see that. And I, I, I see like, you know, when I, when I do come around, because I'm not around a lot, but when I do come around, they gravitate towards me. They want to hang out with me. If I'm going to the store, they're like, can I come with you? And I'm like, yeah, like, I'm just going to the store. But I, I understand that it's about, you know, seeing someone in yourself, essentially. Well, I think that is a beautiful note to end on. I thank all three of you so very much for sharing your experiences and your practices with us this morning. And I thank you all for joining us for this conversation. I definitely encourage you to keep the questions going throughout the day as you see these folks in the hallway. And as I said before, it is really just an honor and a privilege for me to be here in this conversation with y'all because my young black queer self could have never imagined that I'd be in this space talking about these things. So thank you very much. Thank you.